we're at the halfway point of another tumultuous year in emerging markets. Emerging markets having trailed uh, developed markets this year. We've been facing some pretty intense macro uh, and regulatory headwinds um, since the asset class peaked in mid-February. Um, and really the principal drivers of this uh, uh, challenging period have been um, the signs of a steeper yield curve in the US, which lowered risk appetites at a time that that raised foreign exchange volatility and increased borrowing costs for emerging for the riskier emerging markets. So the resilience of the dollar um, throughout this year, the rising incidence of COVID um, in various of the more vulnerable emerging markets, such as India or Brazil or the Philippines, uh, the uneven vaccine rollout um, together with a resurgence of political risks. Now, we always deal with political risks in emerging markets. It's part of the furniture, if you like, but it's helped this uneasy narrative uh, for the asset class um, and it's just created a background of further challenge. Um, now, the pullback has also been pronounced in um, growth stocks in North Asia, especially tech and e-commerce, and that is because of their higher index weighting. So, um, funds flowing out of the asset class um, have not helped equally Positioning was very high at the beginning of the year. Um, and, 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 and part of that is also valuation. So we came into this year with very high expectations because these were stocks that had really benefited from uh, the trends of the pandemic and amplified by, by the pandemic. Um, and, and the other headwind here that has really affected um, uh, tech uh, in Asia and China in particular is regulation. Um, the pullback has been much less pronounced for the value regions um, of Latin America and uh, emerging Europe and Africa. And they've obviously been buoyed by rising commodity prices and a strong oil price. Um, now, the, the, the contrast has been very much in China, where we retain a, an anchor positioning. Um, and China has struggled to perform despite delivering 18% GDP growth in the first quarter. And that very strong underlying GDP growth is uh, a function of resilient exports, of strong domestic consumption and, and high levels of capital expenditure. But it did lead to the tightening of domestic liquidity. Um, and that coincided with also the, the, the tightening of regulatory headwinds. Um, now, the, the, the final feature of the first half has been um, optimism around earnings. And that has been very much vindicated by earnings as they've come through. Um, and particularly for the quality growth companies that we are focused on. And we remain positive about the drivers of earnings growth in the second half and into next year. Um, but I think what I'd find, what I'd end on here is that this is an uneven trajectory of recovery in emerging markets. And I think that really underlines the importance, first of all, of diversification uh, within a portfolio, and secondly, of a quality-based um, stock picking strategy. Um, having said all that, we have underperformed uh, slightly in the first half, um, but very much have been picking up relative performance um, in, uh, in, in, in recent months. Um, and I, I think looking into the second half, um, I think that the strength of earnings revisions and particularly related to the high return on investment companies that we're focused on, uh, we really look to the second half with much greater optimism. The drivers of change in China in terms of the digitalization of the economy, uh, the, the increasing dominance of social networks and how, are, and how they are building network effects in their business, uh, businesses at a time now that valuations have really come back a very long way. So the um, tech space in China, which again was insignificant five years ago, but is now very, very important, um, it was worth $3 trillion in February. A trillion dollars has been wiped off the valuation of tech companies in China this year. So that, to us, creates some very interesting opportunities. Um, and, and, and I think there is real value in this space, too. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is in relation to Korea and Taiwan, uh, where uh, which are homes really to um, globally leading uh, uh, globally dominant leading edge technology companies, uh, whether it's semiconductor foundry, um, wh whether it is other leading su uh, suppliers um, uh, into the uh, tech 
um, supply chain. Um, and again, the strength of the cycle there, we believe, is um, uh, one that we can look to with some confidence into the second half of this year and into next. And these are really strong, globally dominant uh, companies with, with, with very um, powerful um, intellectual property. So that's a, a, a big area of focus for us. And equally, domestic drivers of growth in Korea are also quite strong. So we've got some interesting exposure there to consumption in Korea. Um, ASEAN is more challenging. These are more vulnerable markets in terms of their dependence on tourism, which remains absolutely dead in its tracks. Uh, and they are more vulnerable in terms of their sovereign um, uh, exposure. Um, domestically, growth is flat on its back. Um, so we see very few opportunities in ASEAN, which are markets such as Thailand, the Philippines, um, Indonesia. However, again, uh, we're seeing some really interesting opportunities in the e-commerce space. Um, and, and, and if you think that you know, in, Indonesia's internet economy, for example, has grown 40% compound since 2015, um, it, it, and it will, will be worth $125 billion by 2025, there are some increasingly interesting opportunities um, in that space. Looking to Latin America, again, the uneven nature of the vaccine rollout, as well as the political response to COVID, has created some real challenges. But that's offset by exposure to commodity prices, and that has really helped, particularly Brazil, uh, this year. The challenge to us there is that we find it very hard to identify good quality companies in the deep value space, the material space, particularly that conform to high standards of, of ESG. These tend to be companies that make massive com compromises uh, in relation to particularly the environment. Um, so, so again, that is a challenge for us. Um, and finally, in um, EMEA, which are the markets of uh, Central Europe, including Russia, uh, stretching all the way down through the Middle East and Africa. And I think the most interesting opportunities for us there are in Russia, obviously helped um, in terms of the strength of commodity prices, uh, much stronger, more balanced budget, um, uh, uh, but real improvements in ESG uh, in the companies that we are focused on, which are pr principally focused around uh, domestic consumption and fintech. Um, elsewhere in um, Central Europe, we find, it, we find it a real challenge to find companies that conform to our investment criteria relating to identifying companies with strong returns on invested capital that are sustainable. Um, and the same applies really to the Middle East and Africa. Um, the recent events in, in South Africa are frankly tragic. Um, uh, and, and I think we'll, we'll put further pressure on the domestic economy as we look into the second half. Um, in terms of uh, themes, and this I, I think is centered in China, but has wider application, but it's really a, a really powerful driver of the 14th five-year plan in China. And that is quality growth, not just growth for its own sake. Um, and that underpins uh, themes in terms of urbanization. Um, and with urbanization, uh, comes uh, higher levels of productivity and growing levels of essentially middle-class spending power uh, and affluence. Um, you're, you're probably not aware, but I think there are 140 cities in China with a population of more than a million people. And it is as the drivers of growth percolate down to, combined with the digitalization of China into these third and fourth and fifth tier cities, that there is an enormous um, uh, tailwind, if you like, if you think about how China will develop uh, in the next five years in terms of the uh, growth uh, uh, in disposable incomes uh, and aspirations in these third and fourth and fifth tier cities in China. Um, so urbanization uh, captures a, a, a great deal um, of themes. The second uh, area where we see a lot of interesting opportunity is uh, technology innovation, not just in terms of leading edge technology, but in terms of um, data um, and um, artificial intelligence and, and, and robotics and so on. Emerging economies are just beginning to digitalize. Uh, and again, that brings with it huge advances in productivity. And then the final big theme, I think, is the renewable space. So China's decarbonization agenda is um, really leading the world in, in some ways. Um, 
And, and I think my final remark on how we think about themes and growth in emerging markets and, 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 and capturing that growth is actually echoing something quite powerful that Bill Gates said. And he said, we always overestimate the change that will happen in the next two years, but we underestimate the change that will happen in the next 10. And that is really why you want to be exposed to emerging markets. It's the changes that we will see in the next 10 years. First of all, in terms of um, policy in China, uh, because of the high levels of growth this year, that has created an environment in which liquidity has been tightening. We saw the first signs of liquidity loosening up a bit, easing a little bit last Friday when rate reserve requirements were, were cut. And we believe that the liquidity environment in China in the second half will be more, more favourable. Now, the big issue in China this year has really been uh, regulation, and this affects uh, us and our stocks at two levels. Uh, and it applies at two levels. First of all, is in terms of the Chinese authorities themselves who have been tighten, tightening regulation, uh, particularly on uh, uh, companies that are building massive data uh, resources. And so that obviously affects the e-commerce companies, the big social network platforms, uh, the fintechs, uh, and so on. Um, and the whole um, uh, driver of uh, the regulator's intent here is uh, really to ensure that the government gets a seat at the table in terms of data flow, which hitherto has been really um, uh, that the, the e commerce companies, the social platforms have had a free reign over it. Um, They've made their policy reasonably clear. And so, for example, there was a great example last week with the uh, listing of Didi, um, which is the essentially the Uber of China. In fact, it bought Uber in China um, a couple of years ago. So the monopol monopoly um, uh, uh, taxi company in, in China. And Didi had ignored the regulator uh, in the run up to the IPO. Um, and the regulator clamped down very hard immediately after the IPO. So to some extent, Didi bought that on itself. The regulator had been reasonably, um, been forthcoming uh, with the company. So it's a, it's a matter of the companies adjusting. And this is, again, what happened following the Ant IPO, which was um, postponed uh, in October last year. So these are big issues, but it is a question of the companies and the, the, the regulators working much more closely together when the aim of the regulator is really to create a much more robust structure where none existed before um, to uh, protect state and consumer interests. Um, across, and, and that is across a whole range of sectors. So e-commerce, education, fintech, um, and, and, and to stop the abuse of market dominance. So that's where the regulator is coming from. Um, and I think we'll, we'll continue to have to deal with this. So this will continue to be an, you know, a, 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 a source of volatility um, as we look ahead uh, in China. Um, but I think that but, but equally companies are adjusting uh, themselves and their strategies to a greater or lesser extent quite effectively. Um, so that's the issue really in China and in terms of regulation. The other side of the coin is um, the uh, US administration, and in particular, um, the um, uh, focus on uh, Chinese ADRs listed in the US, where there is now a two-year timetable which is ticking uh, to bring about the delist delisting of those um, ADRs. Um, and it's noticeable that the Biden administration um, has been really just as um, uh, 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 fierce, really, on this issue as the previous administration. So we're seeing less capriciousness um, from this administration, but actually no real change in 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 in. Um, in, in, in the attitude. Uh, and what we will, the effect of this will be that um, uh, these stocks steadily delist um, uh, from the US and will get listings in Hong Kong, which creates obviously opportunities for um, some of the financial intermediaries in Hong Kong. Well, China today is approaching 40% of the benchmark 
20 years ago, it didn't even exist in the benchmark. And the first time I visited China was in the dark ages of the Cultural Revolution. So there has been a profound transformation um, of the economic and social uh, landscape in China in the 40 years of my professional engagement with the country. Um, so China today is obviously a very dominant force, not just in terms of the economic growth and everything that it engenders in terms of Asian growth, um, but also its, its dominance on the, in, in terms of the global economy. China simply can't be ignored. Um, however, um, in terms of its stock market uh, positioning, I think that we will expect that to grow in terms of the composition of the EM asset class. I think we're a very long way away from China being classified as a developed market. But I think very much as Japan in the 1980s became separately classified for asset allocation purposes, I think, you know, in a five, 10 year view, that is also what you will see. Uh, and I, I think it is likely that you will see again uh, a, a dramatic change in the composition of the EM asset class at a point at which China I I is given a separate allocation, very much as you saw Asia Pacific funds in the 1980s as, as Japan became uh, a market in its own right. Um, for now, however, it is very much a developing market. For now, I would describe the a share market within China, which is the domestic market, as the last significant frontier market um, in emerging markets. It will have increasing uh, importance, but it is very much an emerging, uh, almost a frontier market in terms of how much is known about it.